Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. everybody i'm pete wright and that there is andy nelson hey 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 and we spoil movies tonight in the show we're continuing our series of 1968 academy award best picture nominees with carol reed's take on the dickens classic oliver lisa i want some more more the word for oliver is more more honors Four Academy Awards. The Best Picture of the Year. Winner of six Academy Awards. O for Oscar. O for Oliver. The prize-winning stage hit, Transform into the best picture of the year. Andy, I don't know what I was thinking going into this movie, but I want to open, I want to set the table stakes. I'm going to go ahead and do it. This Call it a spoiler, call it what you will. Andy, I don't know how this movie won best picture. Well, you have to, this is why we do these series, because, uh, you know, this was really a big time for, for musicals. And uh, people really enjoyed going to see uh, all the musicals, 50s, 
the fifties were a big time for musicals on Broadway and the sixties ended up, uh, because of that being a big time for adaptations of those shows. And, uh, this is another of those. Uh, um, it's just a big, um, uh, musical adaptation and i think it just swept people up and made people excited um you know uh, it's it's one of those things well it swept people up and made people excited and also it was british and so it it, it sort of had uh, it, it was the dynamic duo of cultural interests right that not only were people super into musicals at the time they had this crazy like you they share with you a madness for all things british uh, and, you know, they were big into collecting, like you, uh, royalty teacup sets and <laughs> and have the, <laughs> the British flag all over everything. Like like you, they were obsessed with all things British at the time, just like you. Just like me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, in this it, just I mean, following up on that, though, 1960s. <laughs> is there a way to follow up? Well, on I, that? I, I have to I have to. <laughs> I have to add more to my statement. So the 60s, uh, according to Wikipedia, there were 156 musical films in the 60s. Just to contextualize yes. this, this period. That's a lot of musical films. It is. It really is. And, and I should say, I love musical films. I really do. I'm a musical fan. I sing the musicals, right? It's kind of my jam. Uh, but uh, that's why it, it's almost... Uh, it, it's real bittersweet for me that that I don't have more of an affinity for this movie, or I didn't have as good an experience watching this movie. And what's interesting about it is it it really, man, it it lays into, uh, or it has the promise of laying into some of the the bigger sort of cultural statements that Dickens was originally talking about. And I'm saying that because I have not read the book, but I've been super interested in hearing your take on. The, the book versus movie conversation, book versus, I should say, the musical conversation, um, be, because it feels to me in in reading up on what Dickens was doing in the book uh, that the movie just sort of, uh, I don't know, erased uh, the statements that he was making or at least presented them in such a kind of um, milquetoast way that um, that that we don't that they're sort of they lack weight. They're there, but yeah, it's not really a, a great adaptation of of Dickens. I mean, you get you get some of the big Dickens characterizations of the characters uh, with this um, from the source material, Oliver Twist, um, but you don't get um, you, know, you you don't get a lot of the stuff. I mean, you you you're you get the introduction of of Oliver at the with the workhouse uh and and you get a sense of kind of the the way that children are these these orphan children are treated and raised um and sold and and uh, the life of living on the streets in London and you get a sense of all of that but um yeah it's it's one of those things where i feel like um, there's so much more in in the book, and it's not one of his his longer books, but still, I, I would have liked to see a little more of that with this. And it's funny because I I grew up um, on this film and the music, but I had never read Oliver Twist until really the last I don't know last five years or so. And oh, really, yeah, it, it's a much more recent one as opposed to some of his his other books. Um, uh, it, it's one of those ones that I always put off because I had seen various adaptations of it and I figured I knew yeah. it. Uh, and then I read <laughs> I'm it. Sure, oh, <laughs> I'm sure the musical really <laughs> captures sure what Dickens was going for. I'll save that for <laughs> retirement. <laughs> but it's, it is, uh, it did end up being kind of, um, watching this again after all these years, uh, it did end up feeling kind of a little more disappointing now. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, they're. There's a lot less to this than I remembered. And um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, so to that end, I, I feel like if I'm ready to jump back into the world of Oliver Twist, I'm either going to explore some of the other film adaptations that I've never seen or just read the book again. Yeah, right, right. Because, yeah, and that's my understanding, too, is that the book uh, went about, you know, it was satire, right? It wasn't just a, a straight up narr- uh, narrative. It was it was uh, Dickens effort to satirize just the, the blatant corruption, what he perceived as blatant corruption in. In aid organizations. And so he did it through, I, I think, I, the the first, I, I think, was a baby farm. Uh, there was a baby farm. And then there was this workhouse where Oliver Twist was actually born in the book. So you get the whole sort of life of Oliver uh, Twist as he's born into this culture of supposedly uh, welfare uh, that was not being treated as as welfare. It had created a, a, sec, a separate sort of uh, caste uh, in, in the people who got rich off of welfare. So that's what I understand of Oliver Twist. I, I you know, correct me if I start lying. Um, but well, I don't this, remember a baby farm, but there, maybe I, I, maybe, <laughs> maybe I need to, maybe I need I mean, I guess, I guess maybe that is right. Was, yeah, there, there is one, yeah. but, uh, I don't think it's like a baby farm, baby farm. That <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, not like our modern baby farms. <laughs> What? Right, right. <laughs> yes, <yeah>, baby farm <laughs> took us right off the rails. Uh, but you know, I and so I'm a little bit on the fence of this because I want to. I want to talk about this satire thing. It's hard to. Uh, it's hard not to see some of the statements in the film as satirical when you start singing about them, right? I mean, the way these this army of waif children sings about gruel and uh, the sort of comical chase. The slapstick chase of uh, because, you know, one child asks for more uh, is is, you know, could be construed as as satire. And and yet it just didn't have a, a very satisfying sense of purpose to it in in the movie. It didn't it just I don't know. I, I didn't have a taste for it. Yeah, it's it's kind of frustrating because I do like the songs like Food, Glorious Food, um, which really. um uh, I, you know, there are, are some songs that are in the film that I feel are just iconic, you know, food, glorious food, uh, consider yourself, pick a pocket or two. I do anything, uh, um, papa reviewing the situation, you know, that I feel like when you hear them, it's like, you know, I don't know. It's just the, the kind of the earworms that you end up singing forever. Um, um, I, I really enjoy those songs, but yes, um, Listening to Food Glorious Food this time, it really struck me how I did not like listening to these kids sing. <laughs> and oh. I, it sounds like a terrible, mean thing to say, but um, I, I don't know. It's just it was kind of just a frustrating listen. And I feel like, you know, I feel like it could be a little more enjoyable, uh, you know, if they if they found a different way around it. But it was it was kind of a frustrating uh, scene for me. Is a food glorious food is actually a, is a, a a great example of uh, one of the ways that this film has not aged well, in spite of itself. Right? It, it's not a thing that uh, you know they had a, that Lionel Bart or, or you know Carol had any choice about, but it it was it, it became such a thing in popular culture. It has been used in so many commercials. It was uh, it's been sung in. Uh, other movies, food, glorious food. I think they, you know, they did it in Ice Age. It, there was cheese, glorious cheese. The commercial. There's, uh, you know, it was in. Uh, it was the trailer song for Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, um, it, it's just it's all over the place that particular song. And uh, so I think that it was it was such a, a it became such a cultural kind of earworm that. He, when you actually hear it in the movie it's it's kind of deflated for me well it's one of those things where you have to look at it in context of uh it being first and you know i mean i know we've talked about many things uh throughout the years on this show about elements in a film that were kind of yeah. the origin of things and so to that end i really can't appreciate that and, and appreciate how it ended up inspiring a lot of that sort of stuff and it's funny that you you were talking about food glorious food because Weirdly, the thing that still stuck, sticks in my head is a commercial. <laughs> it's so silly. It's a commercial for uh, Campbell's um, chunky, uh, chunky noodle soup or chunky soup, and 
and yeah. it's it's a little boy who's it's it's a recreation of the scene and this little boy goes up to the guy who has the big bucket of soup and he's like please sir can i have some more and the guy's like more and he's like more peas more carrots and bigger noodles <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, oh. I actually do remember that. I yeah. remember that. That's, uh, yeah. I'm sure we can throw it in the show Everything notes if we can youth. find it on YouTube and everyone can right. enjoy. <laughs> it's, it's that good. Worth it, it is that good. Yes. But it's, but the music, and that's something about this that as I was watching it, I couldn't help but feel like the the way that this film was put together with the dance numbers, particularly like, um, uh, consider yourself. I really felt uh, was one of them where you see just people uh, like it, they're walking through the streets of London and everybody is is kind of dancing and singing along with them. I couldn't help but feel like that type of performance in this in this musical was uh, just big inspiration for uh, for musicals to come down the road where where things just get bigger and bigger and bigger and the ones that weirdly specifically stick in my head are um the uh the uh bell scene from beauty and the beast when she's singing in the town and mm -hmm. uh walking around and then the other one is every sperm is sacred from from <laughs> monty python's meeting of life <laughs> the obvious choice of course. Oh, I did not see that coming. <laughs> well, and the the other one that that uh, that struck me is uh, in terms of you know things that led to other things. After Oliver, after the intermission, and Oliver wakes up in the white <laughs> and generic British condominium, uh, and he looks out the window, and people are coming down, and they're it's like the second time we get the the entire town singing. Yes, right. For uh, who will buy? Say, who will buy, right? And there's the roses and the milk, and then there's the guy with the like who's sharpening blades and, and the sarsaparilla who, truck. <laughs> the sarsaparilla <laughs> truck, right, right. And and who will buy is the precursor to modern pop up ads. It is the most annoying song now, I think, because it's all we it feels like, you know, 8 a.m. Monday morning, turn on your computer. It's who will buy. How did that become <laughs> such a prescient marker of, uh, 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 you know, of, of popular culture <laughs> through the ages? It's terrible. Turn it off. Yes. Yeah. Very funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because the songs uh, do have. Uh, they do bring some life to the film. I, I mean, at least for me, I really, like I said, I grew up with these songs and I felt um, uh, very uh, at home listening to them again. Um, but this time, as I watched the whole film again, after having read the book, I felt much less connected to everything else going on in the story. It all felt, and I don't know if it's because the songs... Um, are that musical element of their own, but I felt like the rest of the world then didn't have as much time to develop. And so I just ended up feeling like the whole thing was a little more flat than I'd ever really realized before. Flat is a great word for it. And once you start feeling like it's flat, then it starts to feel long. And at two and a half hours, um, which I don't think is a uh, is a necessarily uh, kind of extravagant length for a musical like this based on a play. I think it it's was not Abby. You know, normal. Used, it's not Abby normal. It is a, um, you know, it's perfectly reasonable length for a big production like this. This one, you know, it, it felt exactly like two and a half hours to me. Uh, and Part of the challenge that I have with it is I don't find Oliver Twist likable at all. I he's he, the this he you know I I couldn't help but think about Jake Lloyd in the the first Star Wars prequel that you know it, whether it was direction or miscast or what Mark Lester as Oliver Twist has these adorable sorrowful eyes and it's a completely empty performance and so you know i felt like i i was missing the thing the titular character that i was supposed to latch on to to take me through this two and a half hours i was not interested in him and his experience one bit and i hate to say it but i feel the same and it was very frustrating for me because, again, this was something that I had kind of grown up with. And watching it again, I felt like this was just this 
uh, and, and I don't know if I'd say um, uh, unlikable, but I would just say um, kind of very bland and to a point where it's just like almost forgettable that, you know, he's even in the film. And, and I just like, where's, where's Dodger? Get, give me more Dodger because that's, Dodger. that's so much more fun to watch than this kid. And I, also just listening to him sing is just really, what really did they painful. do? I mean, the, the, it was uh, like, what was it him singing him, you know, overdubbing himself? Do you think, or did they give another, was it another, another child? Uh, I it, it thought I read right. that he sang his own stuff, but uh, it it was not it was not there was something not right about it. It just it, it, just it felt like oh, he felt like he was um, just very straight with the way that he was singing. Like there was no character to it, and and so it, it became this very kind of um, controlled performance. And I like you get a lot more life with Dodger as a character. And so when he's singing, I feel like there's just more life for him um, that he can do in his song. Like when he's singing, consider yourself. I mean, that's just it's such a fun song. And I just really struggle with, uh, you know, finding that same sort of joy in the performance that Mark Lester is not bringing at all. Yeah, I think so too. I think the songs are are begging for a stronger voice. Simple, uh, you know, they just they're just begging for more power. And yeah. uh, and you absolutely, you know, and I I think you can make that case. Well, well, you know, these are child actors, but I think Dodger is fantastic. Oh my goodness, I could watch that kid all day. Yeah, Jack Wild is is great, and you can see why he ended up having a a, a, a nice career. It's funny because. Um, he was on HR Puff and stuff, which was a kid's show. And uh, <laughs> that's the show where uh, my wife had a big crush on him at the time uh, when she was a kid watching that show growing up because uh, it was, you know, one of those one of those kid shows that people watch. HR Puff and stuff was uh, it's kind of a, a wacky, terrifying, weird character with it's weird a- like circles under his eyes. <laughs> and like I always remember thinking that's a that's a really scary thing to be lovable for children. It was a very strange, like 60s drug trippy sort of creation. I, I don't know. H.R. Puff and stuff was yeah. a very weird one. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's it is one of those uh, things that still was kind of fun to watch. There were t- these two standout performances uh, in this thing that I really liked beyond the kids. And I think the kids and the rest of the, I don't know, what are they called? The Lost Boys I've been calling in my head. All the <laughs> I think they're uh, the, Fagan's Boys, right? Fagan's Boys. Right, right, right. All of Fagan's Boys besides Oliver, I'm super into. I think that the whole little cast of kids, their the dancing is great. Their singing is great. I, I you know, enjoy their performance in the in these isolated bits. And I love Nancy. Uh, I think Nancy, uh, Shani Wallace as, as Nancy is um, really <laughs> just really a, a treat to watch. I think she's she was a, a wonderful cast. And the other is Ron Moody as Fagan. So those two, Ron Moody and Shani Wallace, I was I was really into. Um, uh, so when they were on screen, I was with it. Could have done the whole movie with them. Yeah, they're they're really great. Ron Fagan. I mean, Ron, Ron Moody as Fagan is really for me uh he and jack wilde are the two standout performances i just i absolutely love watching the two of them on screen together they have great chemistry and I, they just bring a lot to the table um i i like uh, i like shaney wallace as nancy she's you know i you know i could kind of give or take with her um and sadly same thing with oliver reed as as bill sykes you know i i feel like that performance is drastically uh reduced here um, and it ends up, um, uh, kind of really disappointing me that, that you don't get a better Sykes with this story and cause Oliver Reed could have done it. Oh, it totally could have done it. I, I absolutely agree. And from the moment we see him and he's in bed, you know, he says, do you love me, Bill? Well, I live with you. Don't, don't <laughs> I, you know, I mean, he's just, it's great. Uh, and, and he's great because he starts out as kind of a lovable guy. Right. And so the big transformation in the movie for me is uh, that Bill Sykes starts out as a guy you think you're supposed to to hang with and turns into a really bad guy. Yeah, uh, that's that kind of is runs the whole thing. I think he's a he's a great setup and a great uh, character twist. And uh, I think it's great. My question for you is, is this 
part of why the film version of this suffers, because I I am faced with the question, is this a kid's musical about these kids or is this a, uh, you know, is this a, an adult, you know, story of murder and mayhem in, uh, you know, presenting the case of this horrific poverty in, um, you know, turn of the century London? Well, I, you know, I've never seen the stage performance of Oliver from which this is based, but I feel like in translating it uh, from uh, Dickens' novel to the stage, uh, Lionel Bart, who uh, wrote the music and lyrics for it, I, I feel like he is the one who kind of pulled a lot of kind of those elements out and made it into just a very... Uh, family-friendly sort of story um, and and kind of, you know, reduced the elements of Sykes. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, there were, I mean, there were other characters, uh, but, you know, I, that obviously they have to kind of condense some of that stuff too. But Sykes was always kind of, um, you know, this big, uh, much bigger uh, threat. And I just felt like, I I felt like we really just missed out, and I think you're right. By by reducing that too much, we end up in a place where we just don't have that sense that Sykes is really um, that there's a much darker uh, tone with him right from the beginning. Then we pivot to Mr. Brownlow, uh, and he's the the our rich philanthropist, right? I have that name right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Blue Suit. <laughs> and uh, I'm watching this with my kids and suddenly, you know, the the uh, statement is, oh, right. I've seen this. This is Annie. And and even though Annie was not directly based on Charles Dickens uh, story, it was based on, you know, the I think the comic strip. Right. And the yeah, little uh, orphan Annie. originally little orphan Annie and uh, which I uh, arguably was based on <laughs> Charles Dickens. Um uh, but uh, really, it's a it, it's almost a I, I want to say point for point, um, you know, girls versus boys, uh, Oliver Twist story. Uh, and I, I would take uh, Annie and Daddy Warbucks uh, uh, over this story because I think this is another angle in Oliver where, uh, you know, the Mr. Brownlow story is very, very thin. And that's something that is a, another element that's really disappointing. I mean, there's this whole element of of Oliver's mother that, uh, I mean, the book begins with her and we don't get any of that, kind of that element when he's born, um, which is, uh, it's disappointing that we don't see that. I think I've never seen um, uh, David Lean's version. I think he did. I think he was the first one to adapt it, if memory serves, um, back in the 40s. Um, that has all of that stuff in the beginning. I need to watch that one because I hear it's quite good. Um, I, 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 I think that by leaving out um, a lot of kind of that backstory, um, by the time we get to Brownlow, who then has the realization that that uh oliver is his niece's son um it, it all ends up kind of feeling a little late in the game and it's a little odd to kind of throw that in without having any other information earlier um and so you know it's 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 not awful i don't uh i don't mind it i know as a kid i just always loved that whole element because it's like you know this idea of getting found and and you know you're somebody important and all that sort of stuff i thought it was kind of nice but but now i just feel like there isn't enough to really develop it properly well yeah because without that then the entire post intermission you know, hour of this film is built on a massive coincidence right uh, that it, it it is a miracle that these uh, Fagan's boys would pickpocket this guy who happens to be father to Oliver's mother at this time in this city in history. I, I just well, wholly unbelievable. 
that's but that's storytelling and that's you get that all the time in storytelling and you definitely get that all the time in dickens i mean that's just how these sorts of things unfold where it's it's all these random acts of coincidence that bring people together um, but but that's not that that's not the point the point is here that as a cinematic trope it is made worse without the setup that there is a setup to that coincidence right yeah that there is backstory that actually gives us the connective tissue between, uh, you know, Mr. Blue Suit and his daughter who ran away and the locket and all of this stuff that presumably exists. But having been exercised from uh, the, the musical, it makes the second act uh, less uh, compelling, makes it so much more accidental, even than what you would expect in Dickens. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I've made my case. You know, we didn't say that uh, old Bill Sykes, when we're talking about Bill Sykes, uh, Bill Sykes was Carol Reed's nephew. And uh, it, it was actually the uh, producer, John Wolfe, who suggested uh, that uh, Oliver Reed should be uh, uh, Bill Sykes and didn't know that uh, they were that that Carol Reed was Oliver's uncle. I think that's just brilliant. That is a Dickensian coincidence, Andy. <laughs> right there. Right, right <laughs> yes, there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Tie a bow on it. Well, it's interesting looking at the people who could have been in the film. Like Ron Moody, you know, they'd talked to. I mean, he he actually um, was Fagan on the London stage. Um, but because they weren't sure if he was big enough, they were looking at actors, like known film actors first. So Peter Sellers, Dick Van Dyke, Peter O'Toole reportedly had all been uh, asked and turned it down. And then they finally went to Ron Moody and said, all right, Ron, I guess you did. OK, we'll let you do it on the on the big screen. And um, and so so he brought he he was in it. Um, Shaney Wallace as Nancy. Um, apparently, they'd also asked Liz Taylor and Julie Andrews as options. And what I think is really interesting is that Carol Reed actually also was thinking about casting Shirley Basie to play the role. But the Hollywood studio bosses rejected it because at the time they felt that the public was not ready for a black Nancy. Wow. Very interesting. I would uh, love to see that. I think that just uh, says a lot for Carol Reed and what he was uh, trying to do here. It could have been bold casting. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's I mean, it's a really interesting uh, group of actors, even if some of their performances aren't, uh, you know, they, they don't stand out anymore for me. Oswald Morris is behind the camera. Um, I, I don't believe we've talked about Oswald Morris. Have we talked about? We Oswald have Morris? not talked about Oswald Morris, although weirdly the name is familiar. But maybe it's because Oswald Morris has done films like The Man Who Came In from the Cold, Great Muppet Caper, and The Dark Crystal. Clearly <laughs> stuff I like. <laughs> Therefore, we should talk about Oswald Morris, and we likely will at some point. Uh, I what do you think of the production in terms of um, you know just presentation of musical? You know, I, I, as I watched it, I was looking at some of the stuff, like how they would set up the musical scenes and uh, the non-musical scenes. And I felt like there were a lot of long takes during the musical scenes. And, uh, you know, it was probably because they were uh, building the choreography to, um, to really make it uh, work best as in long takes because you can really buy into the fact that all these people are doing all these big dances in the middle of the road etc cetera, etc cetera. i uh to that end i thought that it worked pretty nicely uh, in the context of a musical i think that uh the rest of the film it, you know what i did like about it is they opened it up where it actually even though it was all shot like on stages it actually felt very um very open it didn't feel like a stage production necessarily and so to that end i give uh, i do give credit to oswald morris plus the production design team uh and uh you know the costume team they 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 did a great job of making it not feel like just a filmed stage production it, it's hard for me not to look at this and compare it to you know not decades later um les mis right that the, the um, any of the productions, but really I'm thinking about 2012, uh, which I really liked. And I know I, you're not a huge fan of it. Uh, am I right? Do I remember that correctly? Which one? Uh, 2012, the Tom Hooper uh, directed film, Hugh Jackman, Russell Crowe. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking of. I liked the music. 
Uh, I, I, I liked... <laughs> The I like I, I which really, was based on the Broadway play. No, I know, but <laughs> I mean, I, I generally liked the performances. My struggle with that was the way that it was shot um, with a lot of wide angle lenses close up, where I just felt like you know we're deforming people's faces. Yeah, that actually that's a that was definitely a visual statement. But when you look at how it presented uh, Paris. Uh, yeah, no. I, I found a real parallel between these two, and I actually quite enjoyed it. I, I liked I can, the way I can see that, you know, yeah. I, I really like the way that the, you know, it, 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 what I'm trying to tell you, Andy, is that I agree with you that you're right. <laughs> and I appreciate your perspective so much uh, because you're right. It doesn't feel like a staged musical. It doesn't feel like something that we're, you know, um, that was just directly and I'm, you know, then taking contrast the comparison to the producers 2005, which which feels much more like a uh, you know, staged musical to me. This was, you, you know, uh, something that was a departure from from that um, in Oliver. And I appreciated it. Yes. Nice job, Oswald. Good job. You already mentioned uh, music by Lionel Bart, uncredited, I think, Johnny Green. Uh, overall, I, I've never been like you uh, uh, were really connected with this it sounds like early i was never really connected with oliver twist the music and so um for me i think the first time i heard consider yourself it was probably on a kids show or um something like i just don't have that that connection i don't think i listened to or saw the entire production until high school interesting okay yeah and it's one of those things i think that there are films like this musicals like this where when you watch them at a certain point, um, it will stick with you longer just because of the way that it kind of those tunes shaped themselves in your head at the time. I think so. I agree. I like it. My kids liked it. I don't think this is a this is going to be one that's going to replace Dear Evan Hansen in our rotation. I don't even know what that is. <gasps> what? <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> don't worry. Andy. Is that a musical? There's a movie coming. It is a, uh, a Broadway and Tony dominating musical that came out last year. You should check it out. <laughs> it's no. a real, it's a real feel good, uh, feel good kind of thing. Oh, is that the one, the like the Suicide Note one? Shh, it's a, you're totally spoiling it. <laughs> Am I? I thought that's what it was all about. Like faking yeah. a Suicide Note that's, or something. That's right. That's right. It starred uh, Ben Platt, uh, who was in Pitch Perfect. He was the Darth Vader wielding. Uh, kind of nerdy guy in Pitch Perfect, uh, who was fantastic, and he is great as Evan Hansen. So, and okay. and word is that the movie is coming, <laughs> and he might be in it. So that'd be great. Big fan here. Big fan. I I I know nothing about it. This will be a good time for you to think about something new. I have no way to watch Broadway shows. I don't live on Broadway. <laughs> 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 If, if there's a bright center to the cultural universe, Phoenix is the planet that it's farthest from. Yes. All right. Phoenix, is, about, Phoenix uh, is the Jakku of, <laughs> of, of the Star Wars universe. Outstanding. All right. Let's talk about what you what you find. Did you find anything uh, interesting about this uh, about this particular uh, film? So the uh, this was a G-rated film. I know um, we've talked about this a few times in uh, in this overarching 1968 series because kind of the ratings board started creating ratings, um, uh, and apparently uh, Oliver was released as a G-rated film, which I think speaks to the kind of the tonal changes that they brought to the source material. Um, by making was it, a, was a stage it they music, didn't, musical, they didn't actually show the bludgeoning. Uh, they they obscured the bludgeoning behind right. the stairs and only showed her twitching feet. Is and they, that why yeah, they never show G? her? They never show her die because you see her and you see her kind of kicking right. around a little bit. But clearly, those are death twitches because <laughs> she death does twitches. die. That uh, is totally a rated G thing. Yeah, and um. And and Bambi's also, Bambi's mom, I think, had a death twitch. Yeah, well, don't you think? <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> even the death of Sykes is, you know, it's kind of uh, it ends up ends up being a little bland. Anyway, that that's all. I guess not the point of my my point here. The point is that this was a G rated film, and it was actually the last G rated film to receive an Academy Award for Best Picture. 
And I'm assuming that it must have been the first also if the ratings only had just started. <laughs> so first and last. <laughs> Yeah, see, starting in 1968, the ratings were G, M, R, and X. They didn't have, so it, it was a first and last thing. It was like the only opportunity for it to actually, no, it wasn't the only it opportunity, is, but it just, it won. It was a very brief window. Yeah. Interesting. Right, because then the very next year, an X-rated film won. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? It was Midnight Cowboy. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so right. From one extreme to the other. <laughs> Uh, but see, that was like when X was like an R rated movie, you know, they, yes, they really, yeah. their rating systems just, it's garbage. Yeah. Just it's garbage. still bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing. Uh, the second point, it was the last movie musical to win the award uh, until Chicago in uh, 2002. Uh, and, uh, though there have been others nominated, Hello Dolly, Fiddler on the Roof, Cabaret, All That Jazz, Beauty and the Beast, and Moulin Rouge, uh, have all been other fellow musical nominees. And I guess now La La Land. Um, yeah, yeah. And also Oliver also had the distinction of being the last British film to win Best Picture until Chariots of Fire, uh, 13 years later. And no one has, has tried to remake the musical. Not in film. Um, they, certainly it's been, you know, have, ha, it's had Broadway revivals and, and other stage revivals, but there have been remakes of the source material of Oliver Twist. I think the most recent one was actually a Roman Polanski's version that came out in 05. Did you see that one? I didn't. Have you, what of the, I, I, we should start with this question. What of the other Oliver Twist properties have you seen? I, there was a, uh, there was an animated version, not, I mean, Oliver and Company is one that I have seen, uh, the Disney one, but there was one of those, I don't know if it's, if I don't know where I came across it, but it was an animated, um, version of it that I watched as a kid. And it was, uh, like, I, I don't even know where you find things like that. Cause I, I know I watched it on TV. I know it, it was it scared the crap out of me. Like the whole ending with Sykes chasing Oliver was super creepy. I probably isn't now, but as a kid, mm -hmm. it just terrified me. And so from that point forward, I was always afraid of Sykes because he was just super scary. Um, but I think that was, that was the main other version that I had seen is that animated version. I've never seen David Lean's version. Um, I never saw it. Tony Bill did a version in 97 and then Roman Polanski's version. There's also, a Bengali version from the early 60s. And apparently August Rush, which I never watched, is supposedly a very um, loose adaptation of Oliver Twist. August yeah. Rush? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess I should see that again. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I love these. When you search IMDb, of course, for Oliver Twist exact title mess matches, you get a lot. You get... A, a lot of them there's one that's the new adventures of oliver twist uh 1997 tv series are we interested in new adventures of oliver twist don't know uh but apparently there is a completely unsighted and because i'm not an imdb pro member i can't even see anything about it. it's one of those that's just an entry that says Oliver Twist in development. Don't know what year. This could have been 15 years ago, but it's still listed as in development. Maybe that means somebody's interested in doing something. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Yep. Love these little factoids, Andy. I'm always intrigued by uh, these these types of adaptations. It's like uh, it's uh, adapting Dickens is like adapting Shakespeare. You know, everybody mm -hmm. wants to do their version of it. And it's always, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to make a compelling story because it comes from really compelling source material, but it doesn't mean everyone's going to do as good a job. I opened by saying that I don't understand how this won Best Picture. Uh, not only did it win Best Picture, it won some other stuff. This was, uh, yeah, quite quite the winner. Um, it did have 12 wins, 25 other nominations. At the Oscars, um, 
which is again kind of the we're centering this series on these uh, best picture nominees this did get 11 nominations at the oscars plus it won an honorary oscar for anna white for her outstanding choreography achievement so kudos to her uh the wins it won for best picture so there's uh there's the answer uh, it won for Best Director, it won for Best Art Direction Set Decoration, Best Sound, and Best Music Score of a Musical Picture, Original or Adaptation. The other nominations were Ron Moody for Best Actor in a Leading Role. He lost to Cliff Robertson for Charlie. Best Actor in a Supporting Role uh, for Jack Wilde, but he lost to Jack Albertson for The Subject Was Roses. Best Adapted Writing lost to The Line in Winter, which we just talked about. Best Cinematography and Best Costume Design uh, both lost to Romeo and Juliet, which we're talking about next uh, or a couple weeks from now. And mm-hmm. Best Editing, which lost to Bullet. Um, so it's... Uh, I think the fact that it got 11 nominations, again, speaks to the fact that uh, it was a musical decade. A musical decade. What do you think, though? You haven't, I don't think, weighed in on whether or not you think that this was a a best picture win of merit. Nope. No, you don't want to weigh in or no, you don't don't think it was? I don't, I, I, (laughs) I don't, I would not have given this the best picture. Uh, Having rewatched this and having rewatched The Lion in Winter. Having seen Funny Girl, having seen uh, a number of other films from 1968, I would not have um, let this win Best Picture. It's possible I would have put it on the list just because of what they were doing, but even that I question a little bit. How to do it at the box office? Well, Carol Reed got a cool $10 million to make the film adaptation of the stage adaptation of Oliver Twist. Uh, that is about $69.2 million in today's dollars. The movie opened September 26th, 1968 in the UK, then December 11th here in the States, opposite Robert Aldrich's lesbian black comedy, The Killing of Sister George. Oliver went on to become quite the hit, landing in the number eight spot for 1968. It made 16.8 million domestically and 20.6 million everywhere else in the world, raking in a grand total of about 259 million in today's dollars. That gives the film an adjusted profit per finished minute of 1.2 million. I know a lot of this is a matter of taste. I own that for all the Oliver Twist fans out here, or the Oliver fans out here. It's not my cup of tea, but I am very curious how it's going to stand when we rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all the movies that we've talked about on this show, uh, and you can add it to your own catalog and see how it stacks up to ours. First ranking is a very fitting one. Uh, Oliver or The Lion in Winter. <laughs> oh, I, I would take The Lion in Winter. I would take The Lion in Winter. Oliver or Christmas in July. I would take Christmas in July. I would also take Christmas in July. Oliver or Giant. I would take Oliver. That's a depressing matchup for me. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you Oliver. Oliver or The Girl Who Played With Fire. Oh, Girl Who Played With Fire. Easily. Yeah, I'll say Girl Who Played With Fire. Oliver or My Dinner with Andre. Oh, I'll take My Dinner with Andre. I, uh, I'm going to take Oliver just uh, for... Uh, you know, memories. Okay. All right. Do you know we what? I, we should, we're going to go to the mat and I, I don't care. Okay. Here <laughs> we go. One, One two, two, three, three scissors, scissors, paper. Rock. Hmm. Fancy that. Andre wins. Oliver or the Thomas Crown Affair 1999 version. I'm going to say Oliver. Huh. I am too. I didn't expect that. Out of my mouth. (laughs) Oliver or Major League? I'm going to say Major League. Oh, yeah. Major League. Oliver or Duck, you sucker? (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say Duck, you sucker. Are you? Weird, right? I am going to say Oliver. Hmm. You know, we're in this territory where it's, you know, it's fine. Yes. All right. I'll give it to you. I don't even want to fight about it. Okay. Well, that lands Oliver at 328 on our chart. One spot about Ducky Zucker. Um, It is uh, 328 out of 384. So it did not make it very high on our chart. Uh, It's about at a 15%. Um, But we've talked about a lot of films that we really like on the show. Well, that's, that is certainly true. I, you know, I ranked it on my own personal flick chart and 
uh, it, it did not perform well. Uh, how'd it do on yours? It did okay. Uh, it landed at 1991 out of 4,061, so it's at about a 51%. Um, it, you know, it's a film that I still can enjoy, and I, 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 again, for the most part, really like the music as long as it's not Oliver who's singing. Um, it's just, it just didn't, uh, stick with me like some other classical musicals, uh, have and continue to do so. This is one that I feel like the musical, unfortunately, is aged in a way that it's much less interesting to me now. It ended up at 888 out of 1054 for me, which is a 16%, uh, which is not great. And that actually, uh, frankly, that feels too low. If I was to go by the algorithm, uh, I would be uh, shooting for one star and, uh, on letterbox.com slash the next reel. That that feels too low for me, just given how I feel about, you know, uh, Ron Moody and, and Artful Dodger and, you know, the Lost Boys, Finnick, <laughs> whatever his name's, you know, <laughs> Waif Children Who Steal. Yeah, uh, Fag- Fagans, Fagans Boys. Fagans, Fagans Boys. <laughs> So I, I will probably end up at around a two and a half star, uh, just kind of right in the middle of the road for me. And is that a two and a half and a like? See, I, I feel like the implication of not giving it a like is that I, I really hate it. In this case, it's, it means I'm just not going to give it any thought. Yeah. So probably no. No. Okay. Well, I am at, uh, I, I think I, because of just the connections I have, I'm still going to give it three stars and a like. It just it is a film that uh, uh, I, I think it disappointed me a little more this time, but it uh, you know I, I still would put the music on. I may okay. not I may not put the movie on, but I I still might listen to some of the songs. Fair but, enough, fair enough. All right, so we'll end up at three stars with the like. Yeah. Uh, in, in spite of my efforts to boat anchor it, uh, that's fine. That's fine. We are uh, right in the middle, I think, right now, then, of our 1968 uh, Best Picture nominees. Uh, where do we go from here? Yeah, this is going to be an interesting one. This is a film I don't think I had ever heard of before, um, and now we're going to be talking about it. It's a film called <laughs> uh, Rachel Rachel that uh, uh, Paul Newman actually directed uh, with his wife, Joanne Woodward, uh, playing the title character. So I'm I'm curious to uh, check this one out and see uh, what it's about and and why it got the recognition that it did. It is one of those films that we've talked about over the last <laughs> many years. When you say, "Oh yeah, it was up against film X, Y, and Z," and these this is one of those films that feels like it just totally disappeared. Yes, it, it completely. Was just never even heard of it. I don't. I haven't even started. Uh, looking for it but i'm i'm really excited about it yeah it should be an interesting one to talk about yeah see how it fits into this series absolutely well if you want to hear more of us but you can't wait until next week's show you can support us over on patreon.com slash the next reel and you can get access to our exclusive members only weekend show the saturday matinee we talk about movie news and new trailers plus we go head to head in our weekly challenge in which we put together lists of movies related in some way to the movie we're discussing that week There are all sorts of other goodies, too, if you support us at different levels. So just head on over to patreon.com slash the next reel. You can learn more about us and check out the detailed show notes at the next reel.com. You can subscribe for free in your favorite podcast app and follow us on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter at the next reel. And if you want to get into the conversation yourself, join our discord channel for a whole lot of movie chat with movie lovers from around the world. You can find the link to join in the show notes or on the website. The next reel couldn't happen without the hard work of Stephen Smart running Instagram. Ben Lott, who runs all things Twitter. And thanks to Eli Catlin, who graciously allows us to use his song Ragtime Instrumental as the theme to the show. You can find out more about Eli on his SoundCloud page. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. Now, I I was worried because this movie has been clearly 
judging by the reviews, a disaster for Amazon to fulfill. I it's terrible, terrible videos, ter- terrible DVDs, whatever. Nobody was really talking about the movie until we arrived at Yasha Banana. Oh, Yasha. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So so we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to uh, we're going to present you uh, Yasha Banana's review in full. Yes, and yes. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Yeah. The whole new thing. You want to kick it here. off? Or you want me to kick it off? Sure. I, uh, I'll go ahead and, and uh, kick it off this okay. uh, first line. Here we go. Yasha Banana gives us a one star review back in 2010. Yasha watched this on DVD and says, twist, I used to love to twist. What is it with all this running and jumping, tumbling and spritzing, all these little cockers? Why weren't these children in school? I, Yasha J. Banana, your 96 years old Amazon movie reviewer, while I don't go back as far as Charles Dickens, I can assure you that in my day, little children weren't running around the streets, picking people's pockets, rolling on the ground, leaping from furniture and running into buildings. Who boy! After I watched this movie, I was out of breath. It took me 15 minutes to get my heart started again. Didn't the people who made this movie ever hear of child labor laws? When I was a kid, do you think I picked pockets? Never, never. These kinderlecks, these little brats, they couldn't learn a trade. There wasn't anybody in London back then who could teach them to block hats or maybe fix yo-yos. A decent trade. That's what they needed. A decent trade. A cup of cocoa and an orange. That's what every boy chick needs minimum. Later on, they can take in a partner. Also, these kids never heard of Barney's Boys Town? A pressed pair of pants they couldn't steal? A bar of soap was locked in a vault? A decent pair of shoes weren't invented? Listen, I don't mean to be picky, and far be it from me to insist on realism, but all these people living in a hovel, Fagin, the dead-end kids, rogue elements of the Mormon tabernacle choir, and how many bathrooms were there, huh? All you fiendsy schmeensy movie reviewing maven, did you ever think of that? No, sir. I didn't see one crapper in the whole movie. Not a flush or a fart in the entire show. Kids love to fart, but I didn't hear a one. Not a peep, not a titter. Where's the realism? Where's the verisimilitude? Let just two of my great-grandchildren come over, and what happens? They immediately start farting, and then they blame it on me. Grandpa Yasha's farting, Mama. Grandpa Yasha's farting, Mama. Charles Dickens, I doubt very much, had kids. Maybe one or two, but a hovelful? Who's kidding who? And then what? A senior citizen takes them into the streets to pick pockets all day? Listen, take it from me. Your typical senior citizen gets tired watching paint dry. Besides which, once he got all them outside, I guarantee you half of them would have to go tinkle. Or worse. Job himself would have started throwing those kids out the window, alphabetically. And the woman in the movie who's supposed to be the mother figure, Nancy, oh, what a grand old time she had, dancing around the place with the kids and singing and laughing and carrying on. Do you know the only time I danced with my mother? It was in 1921 when I was seven years old, right after she gave me an enema. Such dancing on the way to the crapper you never saw in your life. And mind you, this wasn't no Fleet's enema. A Fleet's enema couldn't clean out a chicken, believe me. This was an enema bag she held over her head like the Sword of Damocles, big as a Voight basketball. But what do you care about my bowel movements past to present? Getting back to this Nancy dame, she didn't care if any of the kids married outside their faith? Okay, okay. So who am I to express an opinion? But a real mother would have asked a question here and there, don't you think? And poor Charles Dickens. When did he write a musical about crazy people dancing in the streets in the slums with the rats and the dreck? And what about his descendants? Did they make a few dollars from this movie from all the hawking and schlepping and tumbling and spritzing? 
In conclusion, and so that I shouldn't say another word on the subject, Ron Moody, the fellow who plays Fagin, a nice Jewish man, almost as old as me, and Mark Lester, the boy chick who plays Oliver, also a Jew. But, boys, fellas, you need this? You couldn't get into a movie where you sit in front of a computer and blow up half of Manhattan? Or else knock off a bank for a few billion dollars? Since when do Jewish boys spin and do cartwheels and throw themselves against walls already? I don't know. Maybe life has passed me by. At 96 years old, if it wasn't for my two martinis and and my rosary, I'd never make it through the day. Rosary, get dressed and make me two martinis. (laughs) Charles Dickens, I doubt very much, had kids. (laughs) Uh, there it is wow this is uh that was almost uh, as long as our show (laughs) almost as long as the show but we rarely have excuses to talk about enemas fleet enemas or otherwise yeah Um, rarely this uh, thank you i would say that was our one chance hopefully it won't come up again (laughs) (laughs) so thank you yasha banana Uh, and thank you amazon It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations. But it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we covered, from Season 1 up through our current season. For part of Season 8, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. (sighs) Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. (laughs) Wait, wait, no, that's not what I... (sighs) Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective, the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been weird. Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! (laughs) Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Reel family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. (laughs) 